Before I begin, a brief disclaimer that this video simply aims to analyze and share my personal views. Feel free to disagree with me and share your own thoughts. I will be talking about the features and limits of Singapore's mainstream education system, the unfortunate normalization of tuition culture and hustle culture, and how all these tie together to allow every single student in Singapore to be on the verge of breaking down. From this point on, when I mention the phrase mainstream education system, I am referring specifically to primary school and secondary school. In Singapore, these two levels of education are compulsory for all children. This mainstream education system consists of an umbrella of common components across all schools. We have differentiated learning based on your academic results, a standardized curriculum bound strictly by textbooks and workbooks, disciplined school routines and teacher-directed classes, consistent use of positive reinforcement and also negative punishment. Lastly, the almighty bell curve system. These features are arguably what makes Singapore's education system an, and I quote, extraordinary success story, and dare I say, the best in the world but I think there should be room for the best to be even better. Let's start with differentiated learning. The whole aim is to basically individualize learning so that every student can learn and perform to their fullest potential. Let me give an example. Let's say you want to teach three kids how to draw a square. You can let one of them copy an example, another one connect four dots to form a square, and the last one to trace over a square. All of them are learning the same skill, but the instructions are differentiated based on each child's abilities. In the context of mainstream primary and secondary school, differentiated learning comes in the form of streams. So this is your standard and foundation streams in primary school, and then your express, normal academic, normal technical streams in secondary school, where there are different standardized curriculums for each. Where you are placed depends solely on your academic cutoff points, and then you're kind of stuck there. Nonetheless, the differentiation offered at each educational level Just one guy, just one Spider-Man, or woman, we don't know, for sure. It's pretty solid in my opinion, even more so in recent news, when our Ministry of Education introduced this cool new thing called subject-based banding. The in-season revamped version of the Express, NA and NT streams that will take all secondary schools by storm by 2024. With SBB, students will be able to learn at different paces for each subject based on their own abilities and needs. You'd no longer be bound by one stream for all your subjects and get to intermingle with more students, which I'm sure is definitely a plus for the COVID generation. So yeah, I think it's great. Then comes the question, what about differentiated learning within classes? How can you expect every student within the stream and even within a class to learn at the same pace listening to one teacher talk? In non-mainstream educational institutes, such as special education schools and even private tuition classes, students are able to receive differentiation and attention based on their individual needs and abilities due to their smaller teacher to student ratio. So what is stopping mainstream schools from doing so? Here are a few possible reasons that I can think of. First of all, education is compulsory, meaning everyone in the entire nation of a certain age must enroll. There is also land constraint to build more schools because Singapore is small, the lack of manpower of teaching staff to create more classes, hence the 1 to 40 teacher-student ratio that doesn't really give the teacher any time to observe and cater to every single student. And lastly, the government doesn't see the problem with a 1 to 40 student ratio, hence the excessive school mergers, in my opinion. Excessive in my opinion. I know it's bold of me to call it excessive, and even as a mere peasant, I do understand that running a school is obviously not cheap. But I wonder how much more individualistic teaching can be if the schools didn't merge and instead split their current cohorts into smaller classes with the extra manpower they have. Is the land freed up from school mergers being used for something even more important than educating our next generation? Anyway, until these factors are considered by someone with a power level close to God's, it's safe and unfortunate to say only a handful of students will be able to truly and consistently excel in school without additional tuition. Moving on to the standardized curriculum and at times unreasonable discipline regime. The mainstream education system scheme of work relies heavily on textbooks, worksheets, and the constant never-ending drill and grind of memorizing model answers and practice papers. Basically, spaced repetition without the spacing out is just repetition. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that most of the time in maths and science class, I'm just memorizing the working steps and model answers word for word without understanding the reasoning behind them. Because of this standardized SOW, classes are strictly teacher-directed. 
they often have to rush through the content and move on to the next topic before you have time to fully digest what was taught. And this limits creativity and curiosity. You have no time to ask why, no time to wonder how else can I do this, how else can I solve this. You are taught what to think. Even in literature and art classes, you are taught to interpret things a certain way because the SOW says so, and not because you thought so. I remember getting back my O-level results and saw that I got C's for literature and art. And my only thought was, how do they even grade subjects with no clear answer? Do the markers just look at my artwork and think, wow, this is, this is ugly, this is a piece of shit? Do they read my character analysis and think, well, I disagree? And I must say, grading me poorly for my own thoughts and expression kind of destroyed my self-esteem, but I digress. I think this whole standardized curriculum is contradicting MOE's desired outcomes of education, which is to create learners who are curious, creative, and innovative. How can you spend 10 years molding our brains into a box and then expect us to think out of it? On top of the discipline SOW in class, Students also have to suffer through the discipline school rules as a whole. While I get that some of them are necessary to maintain order in the school, such as punctuality and timetables, others are more questionable. I remember my secondary school uniform needed to be worn tucked out, and they punished students who tucked in their shirts or altered their long pants above their ankles or wore coloured contact lenses. There are also schools that don't allow Velcro shoes and only white shoelaces, which honestly to me feels like they prioritise the spirit of camaraderie more than looking out for their low-income families. What if some families want to use hand-me-down clothes and shoes from their elder sibling? Must they buy a whole new pair just because it's Velcro? It just makes you think, do things like that really affect how I learn in class? And could they have used their time setting up all these bizarre rules on something more important? Maybe like, why is a 30-minute recess to run down to the canteen, queue for food, eat the food, talk to friends, run back up to class, Normalize? I honestly don't know how I survive with 30 minute recesses. Anyway, my point is, while I agree that some parents expect the schools to discipline their child, could the plethora of nitty gritty school rules actually challenge students to maneuver between them? And when you need to sit through discipline masters nagging every morning for something that doesn't apply to you, how easily could that destroy a student's motivation to learn? On the contrary to negative punishment, let's talk about positive reinforcement. Simply put, it's basically when you get a reward for doing something desirable so that you'll be brainwashed to do it more. Singapore's education system is great at this. Certificates, trophies, scholarships, vouchers, even money, cash is given out to the best performing students. My school even had a most improved award to recognize the biggest jump in grades in a student. Now you might be thinking, well that sounds amazing, what is there to complain about now? I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the ones that don't get awards. You try your very best pull all-nighters, put your notes in ziplock bags so that you can study in the shower. The walls surrounding your bed are full of formulas because you want to make sure that you look at them to the last moment that you close your eyes. You improve by 15%, but someone improved by 16 You come in fourth in class, but awards are given out to the top three. You tried your very best and it still wasn't good enough. The award ceremonies that intend to motivate become competition, envy, jealousy. Who can maintain their record the longest? Who can ever beat them? Of course, she's first place again. She always is. What's the point of trying? We develop toxic mindsets. Convince our classmates, Aya, don't worry. I also never study. We even sabo ourselves when we become too afraid to study in front of others because you don't want to seem too ons or gyasu. I guess the most stressful thing back then was to not be caught doing something uncool like studying. Oh god forbid. I used to lie about my results to those who asked. Not because I did badly, but because I did well. Keep checking around. When they come to exam, when they get the result, they will go around and ask, Hey, how many points you get? How many points you get? I'm thinking like, this is not so healthy. I somehow developed this thinking that if I do better than my friends, then they would secretly hate me because nobody likes to show off. I grew out of it now, thank God. Anyway, obviously the top students deserve their awards. I'm not saying to take away the positive reinforcement just to spare feelings, but I think it can be generalised. Instead of the awards being the only award, make it an extra reward. Reward every student for simply doing their best, 
for battling their own minds during exam period, for completing the exams. Because on the contrary to adults who choose to teach, students didn't have a choice to go to school. Honestly, maybe the uprising of dystopian novels and movies we ironically had back in 2012 were onto something. The fact that they all didn't shower because it was a waste of time. Sound familiar? Yeah. Get some help. Anyway, reward effort. Don't just give certificates to the top students and then give the others a pep talk that the most important thing is that you did your best. Show them that their efforts matter. On the topic of not feeling good enough about results, I think it's important to address the spawn of Satan in Singapore's education system, the bell curve. I don't know how else to explain it, other than it basically rigs your results, but in a fair way. There are articles claiming that major national exams aren't using the bell curve system anymore, but I must cover it because I was a victim of its vicious antics when I was in secondary school. Let's say this year, the English exam was comparatively easier than the past 5 years. You score a 50 even though you usually fail, so you're feeling pretty good. But the national average score is 75. What the bell curve system does is to compare every student's score and base the grading off of the scores. So in the standardized grading where your 50 is a C, in this exam you failed. On the other hand, if you scored 75, which is a standardized A, in this exam, you get a B. So it wasn't good enough to just do well. You needed to do better than everyone else. It made it impossible to predict my O-level results because obviously I had no idea how I did compared to students in other schools. In my humble neighborhood school, I was the top scorer for literature. But in O-levels, I got a C5. So I'm glad that Singapore got rid of it. I can't believe it existed in the first place. Did you know that Singapore schools hand out an average of 9.4 hours of homework a week? You go to school for 6 to 7 hours a day, that's a total of about 44.4 hours of school and homework per week. For absolutely free? Tell that to your parents next time they tell you you're not working hard enough. Oh, but it doesn't stop them. In Singapore, no one is a stranger to tuition and how Gyasu parents put it on a pedestal made of cold, hard cash. On top of the already exhausting and inhumane amount of homework, just in case you weren't listening two slides ago, 9.4 hours a week? Some students still go for tuition classes because, once again, their results are not good enough. And this time, their own parents think so too. What was the reason that she felt she needed tuition? She couldn't keep up. And tuition is like, not cheap, yeah, brother. Parents are willing to sacrifice an arm, a leg, and their child's mental well-being for tuition. Look at these rates. They cost me an arm and a leg. <laughs> I still have the other arm and leg. <laughs> also, side note, I'm not showing you all this to guilt trip you if you're one of the kids who willingly ask to go for tuition because this isn't about you. I think tuition culture starts to become a problem when it is basically so normalised in Singapore that even parents with children that do well in school are pressured to send them to tuition because they're like missing out. But when we go out and we meet with other parents, we get the same reaction. What? Your kids have no tuition? So why? Why do parents feel the need to stress out their child even more? As mentioned previously, creating opportunities for differentiated learning in tuition classes is slightly more manageable than in mainstream schools. By signing up to tuition, parents can guarantee that their child will be given the attention that they might lack in school. Tutors are able to check in on their child more often during the session and have more time to address questions and errors, especially if it's private one-to-one -one sessions. The appeal of tuition becomes more apparent when exam results come back and there is an obvious improvement, just like the centers claim. And that's when some parents get high and start booking even more tuition classes for other underperforming subjects because they now trust that their child learns better than in school. Students then get overbooked with school, school homework, tuition, tuition homework, co-curricular activities, and even recreational classes like piano or martial arts. I don't know, it seems like everyone back then knew some form of instrument or some form of martial art. And nobody sees anything wrong with it because everyone else is doing it too. Tonight I have to do English paper and also math paper. This is extra uh, study, so if I am free, I can do them for extra re revision. It begs the question, could the normalization of tuition culture be our telltale sign all this while that the mainstream education system needs change? And who's to blame when all students grow up and fall victim to hustle culture? Singapore and its hustling and bustling city life where employers praise you for not taking a day off, for working overtime, 
or sacrificing your social life and emotional well-being for a few extra dollars. How much of this over-glorification of being busy and staying busy stems from student life? In school, we compete for the top score, compete against our never-ending mountain of homework. 9.4 hours, come on, it's even the same decimal point. I don't make this shit up. You feel bad for staying still, feel bad for resting because nobody else is resting. You think you will fall behind if you stop because nobody is stopping. You think, I just need to get good grades, get a job, get into a good poly, and then I can rest. You finish school, and even as you start your very first job, you can't bring yourself to rest because nobody is resting. You are trapped. How did you get to this point? Could it be that the mainstream education system raised a nation who doesn't know how to take a break? I can think of a few possible reasons why hustle culture is so normalized here. It could be that Firstly, your promotion to the next education level and stream depends on your academic results. So you can never stop studying until you decide to stop studying and get a job. And then comes the problem that when you try to get a job, employers do look at your academic results. And often, good results are indicators that someone will be a disciplined and bright worker due to how the education system is built. And immediately, the biasness tilts in or against your favour. But how important are academic results in the working world as compared to factors such as reaction to failure, coping mechanisms to stress, genuine curiosity, and moral courage that our MOE so desires? Like, I do think that results can be used as a relative comparison across candidates. But the practice of offering higher starting pay because of nothing but the fact that they did well in school has to go. As the famous saying goes, knowledge can be learned, but attitude cannot. With all these factors and limits discussed, you can be the judge of whether Singapore truly has the best education system in the world. I'd love to hear your thoughts. This video honestly took so much longer than I expected. Like, I gained a newfound respect to faceless video essay YouTubers. Okay, bye.